Palantir just reported their Q4 2022 earnings, and I'm wearing a leather jacket to celebrate. I'm not celebrating because I think the stock is going to go to the moon. I'm not celebrating because I think we won. I'm not celebrating because I'm even break even yet on my average. I'm celebrating because life comes in moments. And in certain moments, you have to stop, appreciate, smell the roses. By the way, it's Valentine's Day, so shout out to anyone giving roses to anybody. And you've got to recognize that, look, you can't, you can't, you can't take, you can't build Rome in a day. I was struggling to figure out that analogy. It took me a second. I was like, wait, what's the analogy again? You've got to take things moment by moment. And in this Q4 earnings deep dive that we're going to go into, I think that overall top level thoughts, if that's all you care about, Palantir did a phenomenal job of doing something very few companies are able to do in their position, which is become gap profitable. Are some of the numbers not amazing? Sure. Are some of the projections not the healthiest? Sure. A lot of those things, I also think it's a question of if the company can become the company we think it can become. These numbers are essentially irrelevant, in my opinion. It's the same exact story that I believe happened with Tesla, where it was pretty bad for a while until it got good. I'm not saying Palantir's Tesla. I'm not even saying Palantir's the growth potential like Tesla. But I am saying if you're betting on a once in a lifetime generational company because you believe they have a moat, an advantage that is fundamentally differentiated, and if that's your reason for investing, which I don't know what else would be the reason for investing in a company like Palantir, then you give it some time and you celebrate the small wins along the journey. Real quick, before I get into earnings, I have two requests that would mean the absolute world to me. Number one, please, please, please follow me on Twitter. If you don't have a Twitter account, make a Twitter account. Elon Musk has interest payments for debt that he has to pay off, so he needs more Twitter accounts. Uh, Palantir has no debt, so we don't have to worry about interest payments because we have 2.6 billion in cash and no debt. But if you don't have a Twitter account, make a Twitter account, help out Elon Musk, and please follow me on Twitter. I talk about Palantir all the time. I think you would enjoy that content. Finally, uh, dailypalantir.com, my blog that covers Palantir every day. We send out an email newsletter for free every day. Links in the description. Please subscribe to that blog. You will get an email every single day for free at 5, 6 p.m. Eastern talking about the day's events in Palantir. So please check those two out. Now, on to the earnings recap. Let's get into my Q4 earnings thoughts. First of all, gap profitability. They made $31 million of profit. They beat EPS on adjusted basis by, by uh, 4 cents versus 3 cents, so 33% beat on that. But on a gap profitability basis, they 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 put up 1 cent per share of actual net income, of, of real gap generally accepted accounting principles profitability. That's amazing. Why is that amazing? Two reasons. Number one, Alex Karp, CEO of Palantir, said they're not going to be profitable until 2025. He said that two quarters ago. You can go back on my YouTube channel. In that video where I did a uh, deep dive on those earnings, I was pretty upset. I said, look, like 2025 means you get, you went profitable. You, 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 you became a public company in 2020. So five years later, you're promising us profitability. Like that's insane to me. Like why does it take five years to get profitable? There's like no way you guys are growing that slowly in order for you to get a profit. Apparently, he was sandbagging, and he was sandbagging very heavily. He wanted to really lower expectations. It really didn't affect the stock price since the stock stood at, you know, at the same level. Um, and 2023, they are profitable. And so it, a company like SoFi that went public in 2021, they just announced on their last earnings call, and, 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 and you know they had a really good earnings, that they're going to be profitable by the end of this year. Palantir is already profitable two years after being a public company, which is very hard to do given the macroeconomic recession we just went through for Palantir to put up some profit given how fast they're trying to grow, given how aggressive they are, given how much they're spending on sales and marketing and, and stock-based compensation. So for them to actually become profitable, to me, this is the only thing that really matters in this earnings because that showed a level of fiscal responsibility to get to that profitability. Now, here's the risk. Can Palantir maintain gap profitability over the next you know, 10, 10 years, however long they're a company, because you don't want to go backwards. You don't want to be Alex Carp fluffing your chest, basically saying, you guys can't tell us anything. We're profitable now, which I love to see that demeanor from him. It, it was it was strong. It was sturdy. It was adamant. And then the next quarter, you're hiding behind, you know, an audio call versus a video call saying, yeah, this quarter was tough. We're not profitable. I mean, I really do not think Palantir wants to be at that level. So in my opinion, becoming gap profitable means they sent a signal to the market saying, look, Wall Street, you guys can't really, you know, you don't really respect companies that are unprofitable. We're profitable. Now it's time to take a serious look into what the hell we're building because our profitability means now you have the green light, at least from your institutional managers and hedge fund managers, to actually look at this company. I don't think they want to go backwards. So the challenge is, will they be able to keep up gap profitability? There was some financial engineering they had to do in terms of an acquisition with Japan and some of the SPAC sell-offs. They made $14 million in interest off their money. So there's a lot of things that went in to getting that $31 million of profit. But I don't think they would be confident enough to say we are profitable, declare it to the market, 
And then in an, in a quarter or two, they're like, yeah, this quarter sucked. We're not profitable. Unless something catastrophic happens, unless, you know, something is really bad, which then we'll understand, right? There's a global macro event, whatever. But outside of that, I think Palantir is choosing to be profitable for a very long time. And if they can continue this profitability, that's the biggest thing that I got from earnings. So that was the, that was the number one thing. Second is revenue growth. They beat revenue 509 million by 502. We expected they would beat revenue growing 18% year over year and projecting their revenue to be about 20% year over year growth um, going into 2023. So they're expecting about 2.23 billion. They did 1.91 billion this quarter. So you would imagine it would be about 20% year over year growth. That was probably the most concerning number, in my opinion, because no one wants to see 20% year over year growth. Originally, they offered, you know, 35% Kager, then 30% Kager. Now it's gone down to 20%. However, they're maintaining that they're going to be 30% till 2025. And, you know, they've said they're going to do that. They're projecting for 20% growth. Just like Alex Carp in the last earnings call said, look, for the government growth, we've uh, Kager 30% year over year on the government side of the business, but some years it was zero, some years it was 50. Like, like that's just the nature of the government business. I think that might be the same here with Palantir. They are promising a 30% Kager, they're guiding for 20%, either they're sandbagging that number, and I'm not saying we should make an investment thesis based off sandbagging, but that's kind of historically what they've been able to do. Or they're simply saying uh, that, look, you know, this year might not be the best year for us because we're figuring things out, but next year we might get 40% and it's going to average out to be that 30% caker. There's not many companies in the market that are actually growing at 30% year over year. So for Palantir to be able to promise that and hopefully execute on that, I think that's the biggest thing that matters ultimately uh, for them to get there. Now, I want to show uh, a couple of charts of some of the things that I liked, and then we'll get into some other numbers. So again, gap net income profitability of one cent. That was a big, big deal. 1.2 billion in revenue from the US business, 32% year over year growth on just the US side of the business. US commercial revenue growth, 67%. At when Carp said it's growing like a weed, he wasn't kidding. To go from 201 million to 335 million in one year means the US commercial sector is actually adopting your product. We have companies like Hertz, like BP, Tampa Bay General Hospital. There are all these companies that want to pound your services. Cardinal Health, that was a very underrated partnership that we'll talk about on another day. Um, that really matters in, in the in the in, in the commercial space. Now, U.S. governmental revenue growth is declining year over year, 22 uh, percent. It's down from where it was last year. However, you know, you're still putting up eight hundred twenty six million dollars of revenue from the government. That's a very sticky business that does not go away. The U.S. government does not want you to fail if they're came, if they're giving you basically a billion dollars to do a lot of operations for them. So having that governmental revenue is important. My investment thesis was never that the government was going to make Palantir a monster. My investment thesis was that Palantir will become a monster in every vertical that exists. Uh, from a commercial perspective, and the government is a nice part of the business that continues to maintain them when things get bad. Uh, government revenue growth, 19%, full year, commercial revenue growth, 29%. The reason this 29%, it's still amazing, but it's low, is because international commercial growth is not good. CARP has said that they are struggling to grow commercially internationally, and that's just a question of other European uh, nations and Asian nations really being able to adapt as quickly as America adapts, and as that happens, I believe that they'll be able to continue doing that. Net dollar retention down slightly at 115%, Full year uh, revenue grew 24% year over year to 1.9 billion. So 18% from Q4 to Q4 this year, full year 24%. And they're projecting 20% revenue full year growth. We'll see if they're, you know, they're lying about those numbers or if they can actually get to 30%. Now, here's the big number for me. Our total customer count grew 55% year over year in Q4. They added 30 net new customers in Q4 with total customers up 9% quarter over quarter. This is the second biggest metric that I think matters outside of gap profitability. How many new customers are you getting? How many new clients are you getting? They grew about 976 new deals all throughout full year 2022. And in one quarter, that in 30 net new customers. Now, 30 net new customers is important because there's 30 brand new companies of all shapes and all sizes that are willing to work with Palantir. In Q4 2022, they closed 55 deals of at least $1 million, which is also really good because it shows that not all of their clients have to be making $700 million a year to be able to work with Palantir. These 55 deals were worth at least $1 million. 11 were worth $5 million, which is a relatively small deal, and 5 were worth $10 million, which is smaller than what their historical average has been for their deals. Uh, so the diversity of the deals that they're getting, now they still need to put push mainstream into the market and get those small businesses. That's where we're really going to see more exponential growth. But the diversity of deals we're getting, the number of deals we're getting, and the amount of uh, different net new clients we're getting, I think is actually a really good thing when it comes to Palantir. 82% uh, uh, gross margins, $2.6 billion in cash, no debt. Again, how many times do you have to say they have one of the best balance sheets on Wall Street? Let me go to the number that I think was probably the worst number here. 
Uh, and this is like the bearish case on, on this earnings. So we are committed to fiscal responsibility through management of margins while expanding our business. Full year 2022 adjusted operating income was 421 million, down from 473 million in full year 2021, representing a margin of 22%. What this means is in 2021, if they basically didn't have stock-based compensation and you take out some other expenses, they would have made $473 million of profit. Yeah, which is a 31% operating margin. Um, again, it's not a gap operating margin. It's an adjusted operating income margin. Uh, in full year 2022, that number is down 9% to 22%. So that, I think, is the one bear case you could argue for Palantir, which is that their margins are decreasing. And that sucks that their margins are decreasing. But as an investor, I have to ask myself the question, why are their margins decreasing? And the reason their margins are decreasing to me is because they're investing in sales. They're investing in marketing. They're investing in a go-to-market strategy. You have to pay actual people to get things done. And to get these deals done, it's, it, you know, it's not that easy to just uh, not bite into some of your margins because let's say you have a good sales group of people and they close a lot of deals. They get some of the residual value of those of those deals that they close, which means that bites into your margins at the end of the day. Gross margins on the product are phenomenal. Adjusted margins need to get stronger. And I believe with more growth, obviously, as they're fiscally responsible, making sure they can expand the business without destroying their margins, they'll be able to increase those adjusted operating margins over time as well. Um, so, I mean, if you wanted something bearish out of the call, I think there's two things. Guidance was low, 20% revenue growth year over year, uh, which is down from 24%, definitely not 30% that they promised. And the uh, adjusted operating margins are coming down. Everything else besides those two numbers to me are signaling that this is a company that is very interesting. And the reason they're very interesting is because not only is stock-based compensation down 300, uh, 30% year over year, so that's starting to come down a lot more. And I hopefully in 2023, we get that down even another 30%. So we really get to a level where stock-based compensation is, is strong. But the expansions and the diversity of deals that they're doing, to me, outweigh the concerns that some of the bears may have today. Again, two big, uh, two big concerns. Revenue guidance is not the best, and operating margins are going down. The explanation for operating margins is that they're expanding their business and that should play itself out as they're able to grow. That's the question if they're able to grow. But then the counter argument to that growth is like, well, they're only projecting 20% year over year growth. And this is where I get to my conclusion as an investor uh, for Palantir. At the end of the day, we're in a tough economic cycle. For them to be able to do what they were able to do in 2022, I commend them. There was a geopolitical crisis. There was an entire Russia-Ukraine war, which, by the way, Palantir played a heavy hand in as well. So there's a lot of different things going on in the world right now. No one really knows. If the, I mean, I watched a CNBC video today saying the market's going to 3,200. Like, right? like, so, so we don't really know where the market is going. My bet on Palantir is not a bet on these small numbers during their first couple of years as a public company in the earnings calls. My bet is that Palantir is a legitimate 10x. My bet is that Palantir is a 5X. My, my bet is that Palantir is a company that you're putting your money in and you haven't seen the S-curve of growth. You haven't seen the on-ramp of clients. You haven't seen the AWS of developers actually form and become the thing that it can become. And it's a bumpy ride, just like if you were in Tesla from 2012 till 2020, eight years of very bumpy rides before the thing explodes. I don't care if they're saying 20% year over year growth. I don't care if the margins aren't the best. What I care about are the actual deals that are being done. This is why I care about the Cardinal Health Partnership. I care about the Cleveland Clinic Partnership. I care about the Hertz Partnership. I care about listening to other CEOs talk about the ontology and it's not just some fancy philosophy word that CARP talks about. I care about these things as an investor because if I'm choosing to allocate a majority of my capital to this company, to this one thing, and in, in foregoing other opportunity costs, my bet is that they will actually be able to expand and grow far more than what their numbers expect. They will be profitably growing and that they will have such an impact on the world in all the different verticals they operate, energy, healthcare, government, defense, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that this will be a stock that returns because the company is able to prove its value because they have a moat and they actually are doing something that's different. I mean, at the end of the day, this is the fundamental question for a Palantir investor. Do you believe Alex Karp when he says other softwares are, are PowerPoints? That's it. Do you believe him? Because if you don't believe him, you should sell and you should uh, agree that their go-to-market sucks and that Microsoft will copy them and blah, 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 and it'll be done. If you believe other softwares are PowerPoints and you've really done the due diligence to understand why Palantir is not that PowerPoint, then it's just a question of them figuring out sales, which to me is not the hardest thing in the world. It's hard to make a really good product. It's not that hard to sell. Now, distribution matters more than product. I mean, this is what I preach in, in terms of, you know, my startup, which is like, you can make the best podcast in the world. My startup is, is trying to become a YouTube of audio. But if you can't distribute that audio content, then that podcast doesn't matter. So distribution absolutely matters. But it's hard to fix a crappy podcast and make it listenable. It's easier to figure out how to get people to find that podcast 
by learning how to do marketing. And so if the biggest concern is adjusted operating margins are going down and growth is not as big as we wanted it to be, I think those concerns can be solved versus fundamental concerns with other tech companies that just don't have a moat, their products are commodities, they have to spend 70% of their revenue on sales and marketing just to be able to generate that revenue. That's not what's going on with Palantir. And so I think we have a very special company. I think we have a company that proved they're, they're fiscally responsible after two years of not being fiscally responsible. A lot of the SPAC losses, a lot of things have been bumpy, but they put up a profit and you got to give it to them when they give it to them. The stock was up almost 20% after hours, now maintaining its stock at 11% on Valentine's Day, the day after earnings. I, I, I'm in it for the long haul. There's no reason that I saw in this earnings calls to sell out. I only saw a reason to add more uh, at the appropriate time when I want to add more. Uh, and I saw a reason to be convicted that they have a long way to go and that it's going to be a fun ride. I didn't even get to talk about AI and operational stuff they talked about with use of cases in the military and what it means for chat GPT. I mean, there's just so much more stuff to dive into, but overall, I think this was a great earnings call. I think you got to give it off to Alex Carp and team and we want to see more. It could be better, but on this day, you stop and you smell the flowers. We got gap profitable. Let's continue to be gap profitable. Let's continue to grow and let's continue to see where Palantir can take us. Thank you guys so much for listening and watching. Uh, please let me know your thoughts. Please follow me on Twitter, dailypalantir.com slash subscribe. Free email newsletter every day for Daily Palantir or for palantir.com. And I'll see you guys in the next one.